work as an educator with the Mount St. Helens Institute. Behind me you can see a mountain that's shaped like a pyramid. This pyramidal shaped feature behind me called Tum Tum Mountain. Diving into Mount Tum Tum, I never knew that I would come across so much information so quickly. And even though the main focus of this research is to get to the end goal of Mount Tum Tum, we're going to be diving into a lot of information that is all around this Pacific Northwest region and finding out just more details about how we can understand how Tum Tum was formed in the first place. I think that's important and pertinent, but you know, Mount Tum Tum was located just north of modern day Portland and Vancouver and is at its peak is very very close to a body of water so this mountain or should I say pyramid is astronomically aligned and has several mysteries in which we are going to try to unfold it's going to get interesting y'all but it's not just about Mount Tum Tum First one must understand just how different the landmass of North America was before the 1700s. I think we've lost our understanding of just how unique and differently or different this whole place looked in the first place. When looking at the landmass, one must understand that the entire west coast was an island. This is depicted clearly on numerous maps throughout the 1600s all the way up to mid 1700s. This is no joke. California, or the entire West Coast, was an island. So if you're not familiar, Canada used to be under a huge sheet of ice um, not that long ago. You can look more into the Younger Dryas floods to learn more about what happened in this time period. As we had climate changes, as we go through cycles here on this great big universe or reality in which we live, ice came down past the Canadian or glaciers came down past the um, United States and modern day Canadian borders. And as you can see, as, this, my, as the ice or glaciers melted, they caused huge floods all throughout the region. And like I said, this landmass was completely different. So the migration or movement of certain civilizations throughout the past 10,000, 11,000 years has changed dramatically due to these floods. New lakes emerged, um, <laughs> lands were submerged, um, rivers were flowing at a stupendous amount compared to what they are now. So looking at the landmass differently, or at least the maps of this time period, you can see that there's a huge river that flows from east to west across the United States, parallel or equal to the Great Lakes. And as we dive more into the aspect of this area of the Pacific Northwest, we find strange fabled cities of Curi, Curivera or Curiva or Anion. Now, you never know where these investigations are going to lead to, and that's pretty much the whole point of all of this, is as we dive into Tum Tum, 
We're also coming across civilizations that have been lost across the way, such as the Naxitares, or known by another name as the Musim Leks, or Musim Leks. And then also in that is the Tanu Glauk. Now, starting with the Mosum Leeks, this tribe was off of the Great River and described in several different ways. But first, I want to bring your attention to the aspect that when we search Mosum Leeks or Mosum Leeks, it's pretty weird to find that it's hidden, not spoken about, and honestly suppressed. So let's dive a little bit deeper into the Mosum Leeks. Etymology sounding like Muslim Lick or Muslamic, and uh, see what we can find within the historical record as far as writings and maps are concerned. Voyages to North America by Baron de La Jontan. This was uh, in 1703. So, first reference here. This the Baron claims to have ascended for many leagues, visiting upon its banks the wonderful nations of the Iocoros, Isanapes, and the Nyaxetares, from whom he gathered information concerning the Mosum Leak and the Tahuk Lauk beyond. Now we're down on the third reference on page 187 that the Naxitares were a very honest fort of people and that both they and his people were linked by a common interest in guarding off the Musum Leaks, which were a turbulent and warlike nation. He added that the nation last mentioned were very numerous, that they never took the field without 20,000 men at least. And what they're talking about there <laughs> is the Musum Leaks that that nation was very, very numerous. That to repress the incursions and insults of that dangerous enemy, the Naxitares and his nation had maintained a confederacy for fix in 20 years, and that his allies, the Naxitares, were forced to take up their habitation in inlands or islands where the enemy cannot reach them. I was glad to accept of his convoy and returned him many thanks. Now into the fourth reference. Two days after the cacique came to see me and brought with him 400 of his own subjects and four Muslim-lek savages whom I took for Spaniards. Back it up. Two days after the cacique, or the cacique came to see me and brought with him 400 of his own subjects and four Muslim-lek savages whom I took for Spaniards. My mistake was occasioned by the great difference between these two American nations. For the Mosum League savages were clothed, they had a thick, bush, bushy beard, and their hair hung down under their ears. Their complexion was swarthy. Their dress was civil and submissive. Their mean grave and their carriage engaging. Upon these considerations, I could not imagine that they were savages, though, after all, I found myself mistaken. These four slaves ga gave me a description of their country, which the Naxitares represented by way of a map upon a deer skin. The Mosum League nation is numerous and pursuant. The four slaves of that country informed me that at the distance of 150 leagues from the place where I then was, their principal river empties itself into a salt lake of 300 leagues in circumference, that the lower part of that river is adorned with fixed noble cities surrounded with stone, 
cemented with fat earth, that the houses of these cities have no roofs, but are open above like a platform, as you see them drawn in the map, that besides the above-mentioned cities, there were above a hundred towns, great and small, round that fort of sea, upon which they navigate with such boats as you see drawn in the map as well, that the people of that country made stuffs, copper axes, and other several manufacturers which the Otagamis and my other interpre interpreters could not give me to understand as being altogether unacquainted with such things, that their government was despotic and, lar and lodged in the hands of one great head to whom the rest paid a trembling submission, that the people upon that lake call themselves Dahuglauk, and are as numerous as the leaves of trees, for I observe so much honor and politeness in the conversation of these four slaves that I thought I had to do with Europeans. One of the four Mozambique slaves had a reddish fort of copper metal hanging upon his neck, the figure of which is represented in the map. I had it me melted by Mr. D. Taunty's gunsmith, who understood something of metals. I deferred the slaves to give me a circumstantial account of these metals, and accordingly they gave me to understand that they are made by the Tahunglauk, who are excellent artisans and put a great value upon such metals, at second hand by these Mozumlik slaves who assured me upon the faith of a savage that the Tahu Glauk wear the beads two fingers breadth long, that their garments reach down to their knees and that they cover their heads with a sharp pointed cap, that they always wear a long stick or cane in their hands, which is tipped not unlike what we use in Europe, that they wear a fort of boots upon their legs which reach up to the knee, and that their women never show themselves, which perhaps proceeds from the same principle that prevails in Italy and Spain. And in fine, and if you don't understand what they're saying right there, what does that relate to now? That the women never show themselves that prevails in Italy and Spain? The Moors? Now, even though we have been able to figure out that the Mozambiques, the Tanghu Glauks, and the Nastacares are all located east of the Salt Lakes, or at least around that general area, we can move west to figure out what's going on with Seattle, um, the whole west coast close to Portland, the Columbia Gorge, and the river that goes far to the west. And what we end up seeing is a Fu Sang, a colony of the Chinese. Now, this is interesting because it's showing that a good portion of northern Washington, Seattle, all of that area up there, and even coming down to the midpoint of Washington, was the colony of the Chinese. Interesting. In this map by John Lodge, published in 1770, it is an exact map of the North Americas from the best authorities. It states in the description of this map, this map is perhaps most notable for the inclusion of Fusang, reflecting the belief that Chinese mariners may have reached America in the 5th century AD, establishing the colony of Fusang. According to some historians such as Charles Godfrey Leland and Joseph de Guinness in their Le Fusang des Chinos, established in El America in the memoirs de Academy, Academy for the inscriptions at Belles Lettres in 1761. The distance given by Hu Xin, 
20,000 Chinese Li would locate Fusang on the west coast of the American continent near British Columbia. Tiong, Bao, its publication date of 1890, within some of the references or search terms of Fu Sang, one of the translations comes out to no one having responded to the appeal I had made in 1870 in the notes and queries, I myself continued to research in all the Chinese works that found that I found under my hands. It was a journey of exploration that cost time, as records of the Fu Sang are found scattered in all sorts of books, and sometimes are found in the places where one would never look for them. It is the result of this research that I offer today the scholarly world, as well as the conclusion I have reached. In the next section he writes, and first of all, Fusang is only a problematic country for us Europeans. For the Chinese it is by no means terra incognita. It is supposed to be known to everyone, as well as Japan, Formosa, Korea, the Liao Kiao Islands, or other islands which are on the eastern coast of China. So what does this mean for our investigation? How does it turn at this point? Where will this lead us to now? Fusang is a real empire or civilization that was before even the fifth century. For we know that information always lags to the world, especially at this point. As we continue into our investigation, we will learn more about Fu Sang in the next episode and how it leads to the road or responsibility of Mount Tum Tum.